As we think about the Christian life, every Christian needs the body of Christ. There are far too many Christians who've abandoned the church for whatever reason, and they say they don't need the church. But we need each other. We desperately need the body of Christ. But every Christian also needs to be personally disciplined in their own spiritual life. And so there is a life you live that's an individual walk with the Lord. But there's a, another life we live that incorporates other Christians into our life. Life can throw a curveball when we least expect it. And it happens. Everything can be going so good. And then all of a sudden, it may be a phone call. It may be an incident. But life throws us a curveball. Spiritually, we need to learn to live by faith. And so when those curveballs come, they don't shut us down. They don't derail us, but we can continue successfully living by faith. And also, nobody can live successfully a spiritual life with secondhand faith. That is, my parents were devoted. My grandmother was devoted. My Sunday school teacher was devoted. Other church friends are devoted and, and try to live off of that. We need a firsthand experiential relationship with Jesus Christ. And so that when anything comes, and it will, we can withstand it. We can bear through it, we can get to the other side with the victory of Jesus Christ. We cannot, we cannot depend only on the prayers of others to get us through. At some point, we're going to be faced with having to make a decision or a choice. That's a hard decision, a hard choice. And how will we make that choice? And sometimes we may not have others to depend on. It's going to be us and God or us alone. And we need to be ready to make those choices. The good news is <clears throat> we can make a lot of choices ahead of time. There are a lot of moral decisions that we face in this life that we can make ahead of time and say, I'm choosing to go this way with Jesus Christ in this moral, ethical way. And so when the choice comes up that's a moral or ethical issue, you've already made that choice. And the same, uh, even attendance with church. You've decided to be in church. You've missed some other things in this world because you've made a decision to be in church, to worship, and to help out this body of Christ. And so a lot of decisions we can make ahead of time, just simply deciding that we're going to be followers of Jesus Christ. And that would include things like honesty, loving, forgiving, caring, giving, being patient, being kind, the fruits of the Spirit type of thing. Well, first of all, Paul instructed the church to work out their salvation. That doesn't mean they're working for their salvation. It doesn't mean they're working at their salvation, but they're working it out. That is, they're making those choices for Christ. We're saved by faith, not by works of any kind. But if we are saved by faith, we will have works that are because of our faith in Christ. When Paul said, work out your salvation, he knew it would take energy. He knew it would take effort. He knew there would be some days that it was going to be difficult and that we'd want to not do what we need to do. He knew that. But at the moment of salvation, we begin to mature in our faith. First of all, the Holy Spirit enters our life. And so immediately there's a change. We feel that change. It's a good change. It makes us happy. It makes us smile. It makes us want to... Rejoice, we feel lighter in our step. But it doesn't end there. That's just the beginning. And then we work with the Holy Spirit. I've known some that have been saved for years and years. Some are like 40, 50, 60, 70 or 80 years. And they haven't grown any. They can't quote scripture verses. They, can't, they misquote the Bible. They um, don't tithe. They don't witness. They don't serve. And they're right where they are, were, when they were saved. Uh, if indeed they were saved. Paul was encouraging the church to mature. He said, don't stay where you are. You need to mature in this. You need to work this out. You need to figure out what it is to grow as a Christian. And as senior adults, we have to figure out anew, where do we go from here? As all of us in here have done all the basics. And we're quite accomplished at it. We know the elementary scriptures. We know the elementary, elementary rituals that we do as Southern Baptists. And we can do them real easily. So where do we go from here to mature even more as a Christian? 
what do we need to do? And it may be different for each one of us in here. It may be similar for each one of us in here. But we need to work that out with the Lord and what the Holy Spirit is dealing with you in your life about. And let's continue to grow. Every hardship is an opportunity to grow spiritually. And so those hardships come, those curveballs come. And they're opportunities to grow spiritually. And if we'll take that opportunity. We need to live out the Christian life. And so he was encouraging, Paul was encouraging the church, keep growing until you're producing fruit. And then secondly, Paul reminded the church that the strength to grow comes from God. It's not from us. You don't have to manufacture that spiritual strength. That comes from God. What we do is participate with God. We do what God wants us to do. We obey God. We serve God. In verse 13, it said, it is God, in chapter 2, verse 13, it is God at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. God wills it. God comes to us. God draws us to himself unto salvation. And then he continues to draw us into that uh, obedience of his word and the will he has for our life. When we're in fellowship with God, we have access to his power. We have access to his will. But God puts within us something that says we want to grow. Have you ever had a time where you spiritually felt like you just weren't where you ought to be, but you want to do better? And you want more. You're not satisfied. That's God at work in you. That's God, the Holy Spirit, saying, drawing you to, to God, making you dissatisfied with just coasting and saying, I want to go deeper in this word. I want to know God better than I know him now. And so God gives us also the resources we need. Whatever God wants us to do, he enables us to do it. He gives us the resources. Somebody once said, do all you know to do, and then God will give you some more. And one reason we may not be getting any more is we're not doing what we're told to do already. And I was talking about one of her students and saying, um, I didn't do these modules. Can you give me some extra work to do? And she said, the modules were the extra work. <laughs> you have to do those. And sometimes we're like that as Christians. We say, God, I want to do something extra for you. And he said, well, I've given you all this to do and you're not doing it. How can I give you extra? We need to go back sometimes to the basics and make sure we're doing all that God's asked us to do. He's, a, he's always at work in our life through the Holy Spirit. But the question is, are we cooperating? Are we listening? Are we responding to what God is calling us to do? In verse 13, it's for his good pleasure. It pleases God when we live our lives for him. And then in verse 14, Paul made a comparison. First negative, he said, do all things without grumbling or disputing. That's complaining, murmuring, whining, and uh, some people kind of specialize in that. But Paul said, don't do that. We need to train our thoughts to be positive, godly thoughts. If you find yourself being negative or whining or murmuring these things that he said don't do, it's, it's just a habit. It's just what you've trained yourself to be through the years. And it's just happened and it's grown. And you can change that if you desire to. Every time you say something that's murmuring or whining or negative, immediately correct it to a positive. And eventually you'll retrain your mind and the positive will come out first. But our thoughts eventually become deeds, so they need to be positive. And then Paul gave some positive instructions. In verse 15, we could sum that up and say, be consistent. We are to live our lives in such a way that we cannot be accused of anything, or rightly accused. We are called to be a bright light in this dark world. Only Christians can do that. And that is, we are to be different. We're, re we're to be ready to, for God to use us wherever we are. Whether it's in a crowd or intentional with somebody we go to see. But let God use us. And then thirdly, Paul instructed the Christians to be joyful. You know, go have a good time whether you want to or not. <laughs> Actually, it's more than that. It's choosing to see the good rather than focusing always on the bad. I'm convinced that in every situation, you have good and bad. It may be weighted more toward good, it may be weighted more toward bad. But there's something to be joyful about. You can have a car wreck, mess up your car, bend the fender and all, and it really hurts your feelings. The joy is, the Lord was there with you, it wasn't worse. There's joy in that. The joy is, you met somebody you can minister to. 
There's joy in that, or can be, if we choose it. Uh, we might have, uh, we have lots of illnesses in here tonight, different things that cause pain and um, uh, disability as far as not doing what, what you want to do. Can you be joyful even in that situation? And according to Paul, yes, we're to choose the joy and not just bemoan the fact that we have something that's hurting us today. He didn't say it would be easy. He just said do it. Find the joyful response to life. We're to rejoice and also we're to share others' joy. Have you ever known somebody that came in and they're all excited, they got a new car? And so often the response is, well, you must have a lot of money. Well, the day before they did, they don't now. They just bought a new car. So now they're busted. They're broke. And why negative? Why not? Well, we rejoice with you. Let's go for a ride. Let's go look at it. Nice car. It may be old clunker, but we can rejoice with them because they're glad, glad to have it. And that kind of attitude, rejoicing with those who rejoice, for whatever reason they're rejoicing, as long as it's legitimate, we rejoice with them. They had a problem with the Judaizers coming in the church. And one of the problems with the Judaizers is they, they liked rules. They liked regulations. And they wanted to keep everybody to keep the rules and regulations just so, and it was the, just so the way they thought they ought to be kept. I've seen those in churches. And they just take the joy out of the service. They take the fun out of a fellowship. And when it's all about, you got to do it this way, you can't do it that way, and all, all this kind of thing. Oh, that shouldn't be. They were concentrating on rules and rituals. And you know, many have dropped out of church because of that. They just think church has become ritualistic and boring, and they feel like they're being fussed at every time they come, and they don't know what the rules are, they don't care what the rules are, they just want to come watch, worship Jesus. And then somebody throws up a bunch of, well, you got to do it this way and that way, you got to dress a certain way, you got to sit in a certain place, you can't sit here, I sit there, and this kind of stuff. Paul said the Judaizers were perverting the gospel. The Judaizers weren't preaching the gospel. They were just preaching rules and regulations. They emphasized minor things. They only looked on the outer appearance. The real Christian life is a new person in Christ. We have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is working in our life to bring us closer to Christ. So Paul said in verse 3, put no confidence in the flesh. That's what the Judaizers were doing. In what we think or what we can do. But put confidence and trust in the word of God. And then in verse 10, he said, I want to know Christ. He has to know the power of his resurrection and participating in his sufferings, becoming like him even in his death. Paul wanted to be fully immersed in the life of Christ. And that's our example for Christian living.